Hi, and welcome back to week two. This week, we'll be evaluating the value applied to sport. We'll be pulling specifically from Simon Torres and Hager's chapter two. Some of our key objectives this week are that we are going to define and apply these key theories and we'll apply those in sport. We'll also be critiquing the value of competition in sport. While we do not have an abundance of slides, the information on these slides is very content heavy. It's going to be important that we pay attention to the details given in this lecture. These details, namely the theories and this critique of competition, is going to play a major role and creates a great foundation for our coming chapters. Let's start off by giving some general concepts and thoughts to theories. Oftentimes as a faculty member, when I tell my students we're going to be going over theories or di discussing theoretical perspectives, I get lots of sighs and even some anxiety. So I wanna make sure we have a framework and understand what's the function and purpose of these theories. As you're looking at this slide, I want to actually start on that right-hand side. So the first th function of theories is they will help explain and provide a framework for us to morally evaluate sport. We'll be addressing that specifically in two to three of the coming slides. Another key function of theories is that they determine the features of sport that make it significant for participants and fans. And by doing this, researchers, coaches, sport managers are then able to apply those theories and make sport better for and improve upon situations for both participants and fans. And lastly, we're gonna return to good old uh, Bernard Suits. Recall from week one's lecture, suits determined and helped us work towards what is and was not, what is not, excuse me, a sport. Suits' article, for those of you that made note, was written in the 70s, and yet we still find it to have great value, and it gives us this framework for helping us determine what is and was not a sport. Hopefully, though, that you recognize Simon Torres and Hagar in their second chapter have a couple critiques of Suits's um, determination, that is, of what is and what is not a sport. And they have a number of those, and I want to make sure that we consider some of those things. For example, Simon Torres and Hager want us to recognize that in more modern sport, sometimes sport is more about performance than it is about competition. And maybe it's more about performance than rules. That is one key area. Also, I want us to think about that there are reasons, according to Simon Torres and Hager, that people might or participants might accept the rules other than this lusory attitude. So recall back what the lusory attitude is. And for Simon Torres and Hager, people may accept the rules to play the game of sport for other reasons. They may do it for exercise. They may be having a pure health and wellness framework in mind. They may do it for socializing. And some people may do it to make money via gambling. Those are some critiques of uh, Suits' argument in determining what is and what is not a sport. It's important just to recognize that in our more modern day, that there are some valid critiques of Suits, although he has stuck around and his framework and theory does provide us a great way to evaluate sport. Okay, Whew. now that we've got some of that under our belt, let's move on and talk about some specific theories that we will apply to sport. Don't worry, we'll work through these. Our first two theories are externalism and internalism. And these two theories will help us understand our coming theories. Let me give you some explanation. In our discussion here, specifically regarding externalism and internalism, Simon Torres and Hager want us to be able to have a distinction between the two because they want to lay a framework that we will be using this approach of internalism 
And we will consider this as the way to evaluate sport going forward. So before we can do that, we have to be able to determine the difference between externalism and internalism. Okay, so let's make sense of this. First, externalism is this theoretical viewpoint that denies sport as an independent source or basis of ethical principles. Instead, externalists believe that sport just imitates the dominant values of sport. I put this little note on this slide because I think for me and my simple thinking, this helps me. Think values are external or outside of sport. On the contrary, and this is where we will lie with most of our theoretical perspectives going forward. Simon Torres and Hager want to argue that sport has internal morality, or it, we should look at sport from an internalist perspective. This theoretical viewpoint posits that sport is, in and of itself, a way to provide a noteworthy and important means for ethical principles. Instead, internalists believe that sport doesn't necessarily just mirror society, but it stands separate, on its own from society. Okay, going back to my simple thinking. Think, values are internal or within sport. Sport in and of itself, as I said earlier, has internal morality. The values of sport are supported and connected by ethical interpretations and connections to competition in sport. Therefore, sport is inherently and or internally valuable just because of the nature of it. Okay, so with that in mind, we will be using internalism and that will help be our, some of our framework to get around our next four theories. I think from a theoretical perspective, these two theories, number three, formalism, and number four, conventionalism, will be the key foundational theories going forward. For us, oftentimes how we evaluate ethical behaviors in sport relies or lies heavily in formalism or conventionalism. Okay, let's first make sense of formalism. In this instance, think formal rules. This theory emphasizes the formal rules and structures. Okay, go back to suits. What were those formal rules and structures? They were the constitutive rules of sport. They were those rules necessary we had to follow in order to play the game. Interestingly, with formalism, their approach to rule breaking is this. If you break the rules, you cheat, and therefore you're not playing the game. And because cheaters aren't playing the game, they can't win. There are a number of concerns with formalism, however. Those include, include such things, excuse me, as how then do we determine such things as sportsmanship? There's no formal rules written in the rule book regarding sportsmanship. How else then can we think about this concept of we've seen it more lately regarding strategic fouling? Or I liken it to, it used to be called the hack -a shack phenomenon. And while they may have been playing within the bounds of the game, were they br and they were breaking some of these formal rules, they clearly were punished for them and that Shaq got free throws. But what does that mean for sportsmanship? I also want us to think about, we've had some more modern day things like tanking in the NBA. So they aren't necessarily breaking any rules, but isn't that bad sportsmanship? And so one of the concerns, or two rather, of the concerns specifically with using formalism is that because it is so rigid and it does resolve around those formal rules, it fails to take into some consideration one of sportsmanship and sportsmanlike behaviors, but also then these more modern conventions or where we've seen sport go. However, we definitely have to recognize there are many individuals who take this formalist approach to sport that you break the rules, you don't play. You don't play, you can't win. Okay, let's look on the other side of this, conventionalism. Conventionalism is the theory that considers both the constitutive rules, 
Remember, those are the rules that help us play the game, plus the central context of the game. This theory takes into consideration where formalism falls short. So make note of this in conventionalism. It's concerned with the conventions that go with the game. Therefore, it is also thinking about those kind of widely accepted ethos. Okay. We see this oftentimes in a number of ways that the games are, our games, excuse me, are played. We have a number of conventions that happen in sport. They are things such as in the game of baseball, maybe we round third base and we're heading for home and we don't really touch third base. We just kind of make it look like we touch third base. And this is a widely accepted norm. There's also some widely accepted norms in the game of basketball and football. And it's this idea that while we play within the constitutive rules, we have to take into account what everyone says is how the game goes. And there's a couple concerns with that, hopefully as, an, um, as a Christian and maybe as an ethicist, are able to recognize that there are a number of concerns that come with this idea that if everyone's doing it in the game, then it must be okay. Let me give you this for example. Taxes. It's this widely accepted norm that people cheat on their taxes. And just because it's widely accepted, does that mean it's okay? So one of the key concerns with conventionalism is this no notion that just because something is a widely accepted ethos or practice of sport, does that mean it's fair, right, or even moral? In more modern days examples of sport, we've seen a recent rise in areas where recruits are being paid by colleges. And some could argue, well, everyone's doing it. Why won't we just do it? And that goes back to the argument and concern with conventionalism that just because everyone's doing it doesn't mean it's fair, right, or even moral. Okay, let's sum these up and take a step back. Formalism is concerned with formal rules. Conventionalism wants formal rules, but really also wants us to consider the cultural context of the game. And oftentimes, depending on our framework or the theoretical perspective we align with, we will view issues such as performance-enhancing drug use, cheating, um, sportsmanship. Depending on our view, we'll view these quite differently. All right, these are two big theories we'll be talking about going forward, and I think you'll see many, many places that we'll be applying these theories in the coming weeks. All right, let's move on to our next ones. Okay, we've made it to our last two theories. I'm sure you're thrilled. And while these two theories will not be used as heavily as some of the previous ones, it's still important to get a framework for them. Our fifth theory is this consideration of broad internalism. This theory emphasizes that norms are not mere social conventions, but rather provide a basis for criticizing the existing social conventions. Please note, make this connection between our first slide on theories of externalism versus internalism. This notion of internalism, broad internalism, takes again as a play on the words, a more broad approach. It's based on principles. The view that in addition to the constitutive rules of sport, there are other resources connected closely and maybe even perhaps conceptually to sport that are near neither, excuse me, social conventions or moral principles that merely mirror the dominant morality in society. Okay, this allows for a framework to interpret rules and sport as well as the norms and or spirit of the rules. And as I said earlier, it's based on principles. Next, deep conventionalism. Again, play on words. This is taking our notion of conventionalism and considering it from a much deeper philosophical perspective. This theory considers that conventions express the underlying theory of sport. And after critical thought and reflection, this indicates the best way to make sense of existing social practices. This approach requires us to find the best overall interpretation of sporting practices and behaviors within the given social landscape. Okay, let's make sense of this. 
To understand and evaluate sporting practices, we have to engage in this kind of interpretive process. It requires us to go beyond formal rules and develop a framework. And that framework can be either based on principles, as we saw in broad internalism, or based on conventions, as we see in deep conventionalism. Both of these approaches allow for the critique of existing sporting practices. However, they violate important either on the grounds that they violate important principles of sport or that they violate the deep social conventions underlying our present and historically situated social practices. I want us to return that at the end, it requires us to find that best overall interpretation. And with deep conventionalism, it puts that interpretation in the framework of sociocultural constructs. Okay, that concludes our discussion of theories. We've gone through six of them, some much more detailed than others. I think from the going forward, the next few sections and chapters we will be addressing, formalism and conventionalism will really help us give some notion to and make sense of how we can address ethical issues in sport. Oftentimes, the debate surrounding the value of sport hinges upon the notion of competition. And in the remaining slides, we are going to indeed debate that. It's important when we begin to address ethical issues, go back to our section from week one, regarding those normative concepts. Is competition in sport morally defensible? It's not an objective question. It's not black or white. I can't go to the back of the textbook to see mm, yes or no. And hopefully we realize this is much more than a subjective question. It's much more than personal preference. Rather, is competition sport morally defensible? It's a normative issue. And therefore, we need to make arguments on both sides to help us determine if indeed competition gives sport value. That's where we'll be going in the remaining slides. We're going to start off our debate on the notion of is competition in sport morally defensible by addressing the critique. Please note, we'll also be addressing the good side of competition in the coming uh, slides too. So first, let's start with think about the critique of competition in sport. Many opponents of competition in sport want us to consider or think about what importance should be assigned to sport. We often make this phrase, and maybe we even tell it to little people when they play youth sport. It's not that you won or lost, but it's how you play the game. I'm sure you had a coach or maybe even a parent in your lifetime say those words. But is that really true? Is that how we really view competition in sport? Here's a thought. Would we say those same concepts to a surgeon? It's not whether the patient lives or dies, but how the surgeon makes the cut. No, we wouldn't. That's silly. And in the same token, then, I do think we have to recognize that telling an athlete, one who has spent his or her entire life devoted to training and preparing for competition, it's not that you won or lost, but how you played the game, and therefore we have to recognize we've assigned a lot of importance to winning. But because of the importance we've assigned to winning, there's some good and bad. And that's where the main critique of competition comes. Should we be placing the emphasis on competing well or winning? We have to, I want us to one, recognize that not everyone plays sport or is physically active or does competition for winning. And many play non-competitively, and they do it for the joy. Some want to improve or beat themselves. Some want to get a personal best. But regardless of why we play, the person playing the game must achieve the goals of the game as prescribed by the rules. Going back, I know we're still calling talking about suits. That's constitutive rules. Okay. But at the end of it, Sport in and of itself has an internal competitive component. That's what those constitutive rules are. And so there are a number of things though that in and of itself competition may not be bad. But what becomes bad, I'll say, or where oftentimes the critique lies, is the value we put on winning. 
That's the disconnect. Okay. So should we emphasize playing the game well or should we emphasize winning? Let's talk more about this critique. Now that we have established that competition in and of itself might be not be bad, but rather it's the value that we apply or give to winning in competition, there are three specific, excuse me, areas that help us understand this critique of competition even further. First, zero sum game. Okay, what does that mean? Not all competitors can win. At the end of the day, there's usually only one winner. There's only one Super Bowl champ every year. There's only one Olympic gold medalist. And with that then, the goal of winning oftentimes is to defeat the opponent. Okay, critics argue that this idea of we can't all be winners, it's either one or the other, we either win or we lose, is that it creates this kind of me first or selfish attitude. In this then, we begin to view opponents as an obstacle to overcome rather than as actual human beings who are also trying to compete. And even in some instances, we view opponents as enemies. And so because of this notion of the zero sum game that my goal of winning is to defeat you, I have to win, you have to lose, the argument under that is that it breeds selfishness. Okay, next concept. Next major critique of competition in sport is that all value is put on winning. What do we say? Losing is failure. Winning is the ultimate goal. And therefore, when we do place all the value on winning, we fail to acknowledge that things such as practice preparation and the contest in and of themselves might actually be valuable. Instead, however, when all the value is placed on winning, winning is the ultimate measuring stick. And if we win, it was good. If we lose, you could even argue that practice preparation and even the game has no value. One thought to take from this, one very popular coach, I'm sure you've heard of him, John Wooden. His idea were in staunch criticism of this notion of value in winning, on winning, excuse me. He always emphasized practice preparation and the contest as valuable, not necessarily the outcome. We'll talk a little more about that later. Okay, third critique, consequences. What are the unintended and intended consequences of competition in sport. Okay, as we should have derived from that zero sum game, sport produces selfishness. And according to many critiques, sport in and of itself is inherently selfish. There is, however, one counter to this argument. It's this notion of pre-selection theory. Please note, pre-selection theory is in counter to this idea that sport is inherently selfish. Okay, pre-selection theory considers a few things. Um, it talks about or wants us to recognize that maybe sports don't breed selfishness, but that the athlete was already selfish. Or you could even think maybe sports don't breed or build character, the athletes already have that character. Thus, maybe athletic, maybe competitive athletes um, aren't necessarily selfish because they're athletes, but because they're already selfish. Some of you might have seen a more recent ESPN 30 for 30 on Dion Sanders. This 30 for 30 highlighted a number of his, what I would call, selfish behaviors. And one of the thoughts behind that is, did sport make Deion Sanders selfish? Or maybe was he already a selfish individual? And so that is this idea, one, the consequence of the critique of competition is that sport is inherently selfish. And a counter argument to that is, though, that maybe these athletes were already selfish in the first place. Okay. Last consequence, this notion of utilitarianism 
And utilitarianism is an action or practice is morally justified only if it has better consequences for all the affected than the alternatives do. Okay, what does that mean? This notion of utilitarianism is this idea that we do a cost-benefit analysis. If benefits outweigh, then the behavior is ethical. And if benefits don't outweigh, then the behavior is not ethical. Make the connection. This is staunchly and closely related to the value we place on winning. So, for example, if a questionable character athlete will help me win, I'm going to choose to have that athlete on my team. Why? Because I've done the cost-benefit analysis. I've determined then that the benefits outweigh the cost. Let's go with it. We'll call it ethical. And this, think, go back to conventionalism. As we know, those ethos or conventions that are so widely accepted may not be um, moral or right. Okay, let's take a step back here. Whew, this has been a lot on this slide. The critique of competition in sports surrounds three big pieces. One, zero-sum game. We can only have one winner. And secondly, that's connected to the notion that we put all our value on winning. And we fail to recognize that the practice preparation and even the contest have value in and of themselves. And lastly, our third critique of competition is that there are indeed consequences. Intended and unintended. First consequence we talked about was this notion that we, sport breeds selfishness. We do see, however, there's a counter to that. And lastly, a consequence of um, value placed on winning is this notion of utilitarianism. And utilitarianism is this notion that we do the cost-benefit analysis, and if it benefits us, we deem it as ethical and go with it. Okay, let's flip the coin and go to the other side. Let's see those ideas or arguments that determine that sport and competition in sport, excuse me, does indeed have value. As I said in the previous slide, we are now going to move on and talk about the notion that competition in sport indeed might be morally defensible. After we have gone through the previous discussion on the critiques of competition, some of us who are diehard sports fans may have our hair bristled a bit, but we're going to go to the other side then, and we're going to evaluate what makes sport and competition valuable. Here we go. As we determined previously, arguably the greatest criticism of competition is that it is inherently selfish and maybe even egoistic. Zero-sum game was one of those major criticism. One's victory is another's defeat. So what type of framework or thought pattern then can we have to say that competition is indeed valuable? And that framework, according to Simon Torres and Hager, is this notion of a mutual quest for excellence. Simon Torres and Hager want to argue that a mutual quest for excellence produces good qualities. And in order to do that and produce these good qualities, we have to have competition. So let's work through this. We have kind of three areas we're going to address, and I'm going to read this fascinating passage that I love that will help us hopefully understand this. First, according to Simon Torres and Hager's notion of this mutual quest for excellence, Ethical behavior can be derived in sport, and we do this by abiding by constitutive rules. Many athletes abide by the rules, and many athletes abide by competitive fairness. In Simon Torres and Hager, they give this account, and they're actually quoting from Delatry. Delatry talks about and describes in beauty, and I'm going to read it to you because I love it. This idea of competition and competitive fairness and this turning point in a contest. And maybe some of you have experienced this. Let me read for you. And this is coming from Delatry, and he's recognizing these moments of testing in a contest. And it's rather than victory or defeat, but this testing that help us derive these ethical behaviors. Delatry states, the testing of one's mettle in competitive athletics is a form of self-discovery. 
The claim of competitive athletics to importance rests squarely on this providing us opportunities for self-discovery, which may otherwise have been missed. They provide opportunities for self-discovery, for concentration and intensity of involvement, for being carried away by the demands of the contest with a frequency seldom matched elsewhere. This is why it is far greater success in competitive athletics to have played well under pressure of a truly worthwhile of opponent and have lost than to have defeated a less worthy or unworthy one when no demands were made. This very passage illustrates this notion that in good competition, ethical behaviors derive. We learn things about ourselves. We learn about abiding by constitutive rules and competitive fairness. But we find these areas of testing. And in those areas of testing, we learn. And that's valuable. And he would argue that creates ethical behavior. And making that connection to competition, it's important to know where else in our life do we get that, but oftentimes in sport. Okay, the next concept. Competition as a mutual quest for excellence is this notion that it requires, it creates cooperation. First, we have to recognize that in order, and oftentimes in team settings, there must be cooperation among team members. In order to meet the challenges provided by competition, there has to be cooperation by team members. Second, Simon Torres and Hager make note that in order for good competition to happen and this idea of a mutual quest for each competitor to be good, there has to be cooperation by the competitors. Because what does that mean? Cooperation by competitors is required and necessary for competitors those competing at the time to generate this kind of best challenge. Therefore, it is my obligation as a competitor to push you, my competitor, to be your best. And in that notion, it is very much cooperation. And while yes, I prepare, and yes, I go to practice, and yes, I compete really hard, I push myself because I know I push you, you push back, and that makes me the best possible athlete I can be. This keeps in mind with cooperation, it is the obligation of each competitor to push the other. Then in this pushing, this me pushing my competitor to be the best, I gain value because I also have to meet the challenge you present me. Think about in a heavyweight boxing match where we have these two evenly matched fantastic competitors and they push each other to the brink. We've seen this in a number of amazing competitions, whether it's a race, a football contest, a lacrosse game where we have these competitors that push each other to the brink. And with that idea, it's this notion of cooperation. A good competitor takes all they have, brings all they have to the contest in order that, that I know I'm going to push you to be the best you can be because I want to beat you at your best. Whew. Okay. Mutualism. This is the very notion of mutual quest for excellence. And so what does that mean at its core? Competitors must accept this kind of social contract that when we walk into a contest, we are pushing each other to the limit. Mutualism can be described as an activity that is significantly cooperative in that participants consent to be tested in this competition. And there's both intrinsic value and, and what we learn from that. It's important to note then that there are many ways that competition, if done correctly, can be a mutual quest for excellence. Obviously, note, I have not said a whole lot about this notion of winning. I also want us to recognize that in this mutual quest for excellence, in this pushing of the opponent, in this even abiding by behaviors and rules, please note, I still want to win. And that's not all bad if I play by the rules. Okay, Whew. so what we've just done here is we've given the other side. We've given the arguments on how competition in and of itself is valuable. 
and can give value to actually both sides, both teams, both competitors. We've made it to the end of week two, and we have covered a tremendous amount of material in this section. Let's recap and highlight some of the key points to make sure we make sense of it. First, those theories. They provide a framework and foundation for how we can consider and evaluate sport. Specifically, formalism and conventionalism. Formalism, the individual that considers following the formal rules. And conventionalism, that which is concerned with not only the constitutive rules, but also the ethos or conventions of the game. Those two theories are going to be key going forward. Secondly, in this section, we spent a good amount of time critiquing the notion of competition in sport. We addressed notions that sport might be inherently selfish, that it is a zero-sum game, that we view losers as failures, and we place all our value in winning, which is potentially a problem. Then we moved on to the other side where we saw competition can be valuable when we see it as a mutual quest for excellence. It derives or creates ethical behavior. We find notions of cooperation. And finally, we push ourselves to the brink in this idea of pushing our opponents to become better. It's important to recognize, though, that mutual quest for excellence also has its faults. Simon Torres and Hager address those at length in Chapter 2. In the end, this notion of a mutual quest for excellence will help us give weight to a number of more modern-day ethical issues in sport. Take, for example, tanking in the NBA. Are teams that mail it in and decide they're not going to play hard or play their best players, are they abiding by this notion of cooperation? Are they abiding by this notion of mutual quest for excellence and pushing opponents? No, they aren't necessarily. Although there might be another side to that argument, you could talk about that in one of your application responses. In the end, though, mutual quest for excellence gives us a great way framework to think about how competition in Indeed is valuable. And for many of us going into this industry, we have to be able to describe and determine ways that competition is valuable. Okay, that's going to finish us up for week two. We'll see you next week.